Welcome back to Redefining AI, where we explore the cutting edge of artificial intelligence and its impact on society. Now, today we have the privilege of hosting Lisa V, a leading global thought leader in AI, privacy and safety. Now, Lisa is a renowned thought leader and expert in the fields of, as we've mentioned, artificial intelligence, career transformation and ethical technology. With over two decades of experience, Lisa has dedicated her career to driving innovation and empowering individuals and organisations to thrive in an ever-changing world. Lisa's passion for harnessing the potential of AI to create positive change led her to become a sought-after international keynote speaker, inspiring audiences around the globe with her insights and vision. She's been honoured with numerous awards, including the 2023 International Impact Book Award for her groundbreaking book, Go! Reboot Your Career in 90 Days. 2023 Gold Video Award for Long Form Series, Navigating Abroad, and she's a Gold Award winner for the 2023 Executive of the Year Stevie Awards for Women in Business for her AI ethics consulting firm. Wow, what a resume, impressive. Welcome, Lisa. Welcome to Redefining AI. It's wonderful to have you here. It's so wonderful to be with you, Lauren. Thank you. How are you doing today? I mean, it's very, very impressive reading off all of those awards, you, your dedication, what you're driving, your innovation, the organizations. How are you? <laughs> I'm actually doing pretty well today. Yes, it's a lot of headlines about accolades, but it all ties back to the same core thing, which is I'm really passionate about trying to make the world better for people at scale, especially communities that maybe have been overlooked or bypassed in innovation. And so it's really an exciting time to be talking about AI in a way that people are really connecting with, and they can start to see futures that are maybe have been impossible before this age of computing and these new opportunities have arisen. And in making the world better, do you think that AI is the connector to make the world a better place? I think the AI is a tool, but not a solution, and it depends very strongly on how it's being applied. So the best corollary I can make to disruption in the workplace um, that's happening right now with AI is if you go back to the 80s and 90s when personal computers came into the office space. It's going to be transformational in how we get things done. It could be an accelerant, almost like that ideal ex assistant slash intern that can help you to get where you're going faster, but it's going to be more important than ever that we're scoping business problems or public sector challenges properly because the tool will allow us to go somewhere faster, but we need to make sure it's aimed in a, towards a way that will give us outcomes for a society we all want to live in at the end of the day when it's over. I don't think it's good or bad. I think it's neutral. Definitely. There's a key imperative component that I'd, I'd like to follow up on, and that's the, the sort of mention of scoping business problems. Maybe it's not an assessment of where we stand in the application of artificial intelligence. And what was also of interest there is obviously the mentioning of using it as some sort of assistance or, or maybe a, a tool that is, you know, this know-all imaginary sidekick in your organization that can bring you the right piece of information at the right time, you know, access everything that is in date that provides you with empowerment and essentially a platform of liberation that, that helps you transform your own working manners and possibly your approaches to how you enlive the workspace in itself. In the whole scoping of business problems, do you think that there has been a change to previous approaches in the way that AI is being used in the scope of the business problems that could be addressed? Yeah, I think the way that AI was applied for the past 10 years since I've been focused in the area, be that at multinational tech companies as a founder of an AI software startup myself or in management consulting, the ways that I've seen it applied were a very centralized model in the past. It felt like there was a select group of people, maybe they were labeled with research or innovation, but they were typically a technical intact team that was focusing on proving AI can be useful for business applications. But it was much more around research and innovation, a lot less around business return on investment and making it accessible to more leaders. I think now we're starting to see this model transform where 
people that are in traditional roles in the C-suite and down, whether you're in finance or supply chain or HR or product development, you're going to have some places where you can start to leverage some of these AI tools to help get your specific work done. And that's an exciting inflection point where it's being democratized to more people. Because when you can take a subject matter expert and give them access to the right information at the right time and streamline that workflow, it really gives them much more opportunities to be using their unique skill sets, what makes them special, uh, that innovation, that creativity, that really strong knowledge of the business. And you really empower them to be able to have breakthroughs that maybe wouldn't have been possible even five, 10 years ago. Yeah, very much so. I mean, I think it is about the the focus on the democratization that is on offer at present. Now, your work per se spans across various domains, from healthcare to online safety, online safety for children in particular. Also, I think that you're, from what I've understood, you're heavily engaged in the ethical considerations and the ethical use of AI. How do you navigate, I mean, the ethical considerations that arise when implementing AI solutions in in such a diverse field? Or is there a special focus that you lie or pay more attention to at present? Yeah, I think it it actually makes a lot of sense when you look at it in context. So I started my career in engineering. I studied industrial and operations research engineering in college, and then went into a large company and started to try different roles across all the different domains. And for the first 15 years of my career, I really focused on learning a broad skill set of how business gets completed. For this second phase of my career, where I've been really focused is bringing more mission into the work that I do. Having those technical tools and skills is a really good foundation to have to be more creative. So I wanted to take problems in regulated industries that probably will not be solved in one generation's lifetime and start applying some of these new techniques to see if we can start to have some of those breakthrough moments, those moments that matter. And the areas that I really wanted to focus in on where my passion lies is really in helping women and children globally to have more dignity and respect in operating in the world. I didn't see much of a purpose in being a woman in STEM with a position of authority and power if I wasn't using that to lift the voices of some of the most marginalized in our populations. And so it sounds like I'm applying things in a lot of different areas. But when you get down to it from an AI and data science perspective, my area of expertise is really at that intersection between regulated data sets and needing very secure containers in order to be able to use those to have breakthrough moments. So in human trafficking, identification and and acceleration, an example of how we use that was being able to build models that could recognize when criminals were using the dark web and the IP addresses that they are are using to commit their crime are extensive. We're looking for that one time when they screwed up and logged in from a Starbucks by their home and didn't obscure their location because I don't need to know exactly where they are in order to get it to the right law enforcement agency for follow-up and recovery of a victim. But I do need to know where in the world, what country that report may have come from. And when you're working from a global tech company, that can be really difficult to do given the volumes that they deal with. Or in the areas of healthcare, I don't need to know the names the ages, the birth dates, all that personal information about my fellow patients in a cohort for personalized medicine. I need to know that they have a similar genome type to me, the same type of uh, disease, and how they reacted to a specific treatment. So for example, if I have a rare disease, which unfortunately I happen to have, it's really hard to get enough people in one hospital setting under the care of one treatment team to be able to see that this type of treatment works best for this type of disease. But if we can use things like confidential computing and secure cloud infrastructure to bring the models to different locations that have that personalized information, we can start to surface and identify multiple patients that are benefiting from certain treatments and accelerate outcomes like being able to put diseases into remission. Cancer patients that had six months to live now here seven years later to raise their children because we're getting more precision medicine applications in with AI as one of those great assistants that can start to help direct your medical team. They don't replace your doctor, but they can start to give your doctor different ways to look in terms of the diagnosis that they're exploring with you. 
Yeah, definitely. I mean, I don't think that it's an example of replacement. All of the examples that you've given, both of those examples, are extremely admirable applications of machine learning and artificial intelligence. I mean, you spoke about at the start with the example of using AI to disrupt, I would say that's also the title of the TEDx talk that you did on it, disrupt human trafficking and being able to as you also quoted, lift the voices of those marginalised, especially with women and children in vulnerable situations. This is something that is an extremely admirable case. And it also makes me somewhat proud that we can use technology nowadays to be able to alleviate a lot of suffering that's caused in marginalised communities. Also, the example that you've given there and one that I want to follow up on first, and I'll come back to the disruption of um, sort of human traffic and using AI as an application, is you mentioned one term, confidential computing. I'm not too sure that the audience will be familiar with that. Something that I'd like to explore a little bit more myself. What do you mean by that? Yeah, so confidential computing often sits as a subsection of zero trust computing. So these are those data sets that are highly regulated information in financial services industries, healthcare industries, or public sector, things like national security, which is where I got a lot of this expertise working in because when you're looking at online child sexual abuse material or human trafficking material, oftentimes even the images that you're trying to train models on are illegal to create, look at, or use. So in using these very bespoke data sets, what we've learned is you have to be really mindful about how do you make sure that the people that have the information and the people that are building the models have a a regulated way to make sure that they can validate their models without exposing data that shouldn't be exposed beyond the use case. And so confidential computing is a method of federated learning where models can almost go on summer camp (laughs) to visit a data set, learn what they need to learn about how they perform, and come back out without ever having direct exposure to the data set because it's running in a black box container that will be eliminated before the model ever comes out of it. So the data owner never sees the model, the model owner never sees the data, and the third party that's facilitating all of that is able to give useful information to both parties about how that data is able to accelerate for things like FDA approvals for clinical settings for for use on actual patients. So it's a it's a unique and creative way that has been established in places like healthcare to be able to make sure that we can use original data sets that have all the depth and, and specificity required to be able to train models for things like pharmaceutical companies, original equipment manufacturers for things like CT scans and, and those things. So it, it's technology that came out of cutting edge research with GE and some of the leading research hospitals in the world. And we had the opportunity to partner with them and Microsoft in the Azure cloud to be able to help to bring some of those capabilities to bear. And the reason that stuff matters is because today it takes somewhere between one and three years for a model to get through the whole process of getting certified by regulated agencies in the U.S. for healthcare applications. What could happen if we could speed up that a thousand times over? How many more people's lives can be saved if we have models that are running to identify early signs of needing a blood transfusion during a traumatic car crash, a surgery to repair that for the the patient? How many times can we make sure that we don't have a misdiagnosis for something that's very rare but very critical? Mm -hmm. It's those places where AI can complement the doctor's experience and make sure that they're looking at the right information at the right time. Definitely. I think that as well, you know, the collaboration between tech companies and healthcare institutions, especially the work that you've highlighted here, it's crucial for advancing AI in clinical settings. But there's also, I imagine, you know, a lot of challenges, especially maybe in accelerating FDA approval or something like that for AI applications in healthcare. What are the challenges that you've come up 
against there and how can they be addressed? I mean, is it a case of capital allocation, human capital? I mean, what what needs to to happen there for them to be addressed a bit quicker? Yeah, fortunately, the healthcare industry has not adopted the Silicon Valley model of move fast and break things. I don't really want my healthcare team doing that either. So being a little bit more conscientious and having more regulations around that is incredibly important. But sometimes what happens is it becomes so cost prohibitive or so time prohibitive to get enough data to actually train a model for valid use in clinical settings that it sits on a shelf. So in 2021, when we started working with this core team, there were six novel models that were approved for clinical settings, and they had helped co-create one of them with GE. And they wanted to help to make sure that the thousands and thousands of ideas for innovation that could really have a huge impact on people's lives to reduce bias in healthcare, to reduce uh, misdiagnoses or mistreatments, things like that, had the chance to see the light of day. And we're not sitting in just research mode for the rest of time. So I would say the biggest challenge is it typically costs somewhere between 3 and $5 million to get enough data across all the different academic hospitals and data stewards in order to train a model. So by making that more of a consumption pay for pay model versus having to buy data blind and not even knowing if it fits your use case until you've gone through years of contracting with legal teams for very good reasons for cybersecurity and data privacy, this can start to cut down some of that cost. It can also cut down some of that time because we know that when you're doing it in a more secure way in the cloud and you can bring the models to the data itself and you don't need to move the data out of the research hospitals, that it allows for uh, the legal teams and the medical teams to collaborate in a much more time efficient and resource efficient method. Mm -hmm. Is synthetic data being used at all? Absolutely. I think synthetic data is going to have a huge impact in this space, not just medical, but beyond. My area of expertise, as you mentioned before, is really in online trust and safety. So those are in the spaces where the things you're talking about are probably pretty delicate. Anything from live streaming terrorist events to radicalization to the abuse of children online, all of those areas. And so I'm really hopeful about the possibilities with synthetic data to be able to train more accurate models without having to expose humans to as much of the real traumatic information that's required to actually be successful in that field. So I advise for a company called Nerdle, and they are one of the leading places that are creating synthetic data. And it's really exciting because by being able to reduce the cost of data acquisition, it really can be one of those differentiating factors where we can democratize innovation. Because right now, data can run in the millions of dollars um, just to tailor a model for specific use cases. And it's an ongoing cost because of drift. That is fair. And I think that there's a lot of interest at the moment as well in that application and use of synthetic data. That's why it was curious in my own mind if there had been sort of trials, applications, uses in it, because I definitely think it can be a somewhat valuable asset in certain situations like you've highlighted. Absolutely. Um, Let's go back maybe a little bit too, because I'm really curious about what brought you to A, your TEDx talk and also your engagement. I mean, you highlighted it a little bit, obviously, with the empowerment, probably desire to be able to empower, you know, underrepresented individuals and in, in marginalised communities. But what brought you to the TEDx talk? And that's the TEDx talk that we're talking about, bringing light to dark places online, disrupting human trafficking using AI, because it's one of the reasons why I reached out to you as well. I was extremely curious about your your motivation, your results, the process. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, so I would say that talk is a culmination of really my life's work. So when I was working in the tech industry early in my late 20s, I had the opportunity to visit 36 countries. And during that time, being a young white woman with blonde hair, I I blended in pretty well in the the business hotels. People thought I was probably a flight attendant more than a peer of theirs in IT. And so I saw some behavior that was a little bit troubling to me as somebody who's maybe a little bit more sheltered growing up from understanding the realities of the world. And I saw a lot of human trafficking firsthand. And my only thought at that point was when I have an opportunity to do something about this 
and a position of power, that's what I want to focus my time on. So uh, after I got married and had my children and returned to the tech industry after a hiatus of eight years, I got up to speed on modern techniques with the cloud and how we were using high-performance computing and AI to solve really hairy challenges in healthcare and also in, you know, discovery in space and other cool applications that inspired my imagination. But it also made me wonder, what could we do if we took these same types of tools and applied them to these other areas? And so that led us to doing some work bringing together the public and the private sector. And I think that's where I usually shine because the the public sector typically has a lot of data, but no idea what to do with it. The private sector has a lot of tools, but no way to test them because they don't have enough data uh, because of user privacy. And so when you bring those together, you can make amazing things happen. So let me give you an example of that. An example of that was we partnered with Microsoft, who was creating facial recognition software. This is back in 2016, and they wanted to use it to help to accelerate the recovery of known missing children that were currently being sold for human trafficking on escort ads. So why couldn't they just use that model? Number one, the model set was trained primarily on adults that were Caucasian and male. Mm. But the data set we were trying to apply that to tended to be diverse female, and younger. And so the models just weren't performing at an accuracy level that was at all useful to detectives. If I am at a 77% accuracy level, I'm going to have so many false positives and so many false negatives that it's just a waste of my time. But when we were able to use more modern techniques with nearest neighbor uh, searches and deep learning, we were able to, instead of looking for the right answer, we were looking at it from a tool for investigators. So when I job shadow at San Francisco SVU, you'll see detectives just scrolling page after page after page on Google looking for a specific victim that they're trying to find. So what we did is we looked at what would it take if we had a model that would take all the images on a specific site and then put them in order of most likely match. So maybe the person that you're looking for isn't the first image that's up there, but when you're scrolling through 50,000 images, if it's in the top line or two, it's really easy to find that child and make that identification. Why is that important? Human trafficking cases take about 30 days to build and prosecute. Most detectives can do about two a month. Mm -hmm. And so they're looking for who are the most prolific offenders that I could build a really strong case to get these perpetrators off the street, recover these victims. Well, a child can't be a paid escort voluntarily. So it's, it's number one, it's definitively human trafficking if that person is a known child. Number two, if we have these tools to help them recover these children, it's a known child and we've done this matching, then we can start to look at breaking up those prolific offenders that are abusing more people at scale and getting them off the street faster. And so by having tools that reduce the time of just looking and scrolling and hoping you stumble upon the right answer, that efficiency went back into recovering over 130 children in the first month that that went into production. Wow, that is incredible. And just, yeah, the, those 130 that have been saved from something that is probably not going to turn into anything that we would ever wish for children to encounter. Yeah, so I think it's a really exciting time. You know, I've been thinking about this and talking about it for a while now. Most yeah. people just kind of didn't really follow exactly all of what I was talking about. But today when I take my kids to soccer games and I'm sitting on the sideline with fellow parents that are maybe school teachers or working in different domains, I hear them talking about how they're using AI to make you know education stronger for their students or how it's being used in government. And I, I think it's really opened the aperture for creativity for people. And I think the other thing that's really uh, cool about the times that we live in today is that, you know, We're at this big inflection point where AI is going to be democratized, as we talked about. In fact, it's estimated by 2025 that 50% of people in the workforce will need to know how to leverage some AI tools in order to be successful in their career. And that's actually what motivated me to write my book, Go Reboot Your Career in 90 Days, because we're all going to need to upskill to keep up with this activity. But I think a lot of people get really intimidated by that. And so I I want people to recognize that to use an AI tool, you don't need to be able to build it. You just need to be able to use it effectively. And so I wanted to make people think through what are their values? What are their missions that they want to 
to impact in their career? And how can they use this inflection point as they're upskilling to be able to solve problems, uh, both business or societal problems that maybe haven't been touched yet? Because when we got started in human trafficking disruption, there wasn't a lot of people around the table that were focused in on this with this technology. I would love to see that scale with the environment and all the green energy changes that need to happen to address climate change. I'd love to see it for senior care and disrupting the loneliness epidemic. I'd love to see it for animals and matching potential adoptions with people that are looking for those pets versus them going to kill shelters. There's so many ways that we could take these tools and really show our passions, who we are as people. It's about identifying the problem you want to solve and using these tools to do it versus getting intimidated by them and and just kind of staying back. You've made me want to sign up for every one of those causes, I think. And I think that you've made our listeners want to sign up for every one of those causes as well, because there is definitely a use case and an application possibility or extensive application possibilities to be able to tackle those issues. And I think that what would be a nice question sort of to end the conversation as well is that given your extensive experience, you know, there are people listening that I would say would welcome a lot of advice and maybe they're aspiring to be entrepreneurs or technologists and they want to have a positive impact through AI-driven innovation. But I'm sure that they also, like we've highlighted in the conversation, want to ensure that there is that ethical consideration and that they are prioritised. So what advice would you give there to have that balance between following their aspirational desires and also to ensure that there is that ethical consideration when stepping in for discovery? Because that's what we want to encourage as well, the, the sort of exploration. Absolutely. So I think number one, if you're looking for making sure that you meet ethical requirements, one of the most important things you do is look at your ecosystem, look at your vendors, look at your partners, make sure they have a statement somewhere on their platform about their ethics for use of AI, that they have some kind of frameworks they're implementing. I think there's some great resources from places like NIST, which are public domain, the National Institute's for science and technology has a great responsible AI framework publicly available. I think when you can identify which partners and collaborators you work with that have the right ethical standards, you're going to inherently be doing the right things the right way. I think also looking at their cybersecurity statements are very, very critical because in order to have any kind of effective AI solutions, you need oceans and oceans of information. And so you need to make sure that they're handling people's data responsibly. But with that said, the other piece of it that you talked about on finding those problems that they want to solve, I think those things are a great entrance point for people to get more experience that maybe haven't done these as as much. So I love organizations like DataKind that put out hackathon challenges around different topics so you can join a team. Maybe your area of expertise was more like mine by the time I got involved in this. I was more of a sales and marketing person than any kind of technical person by the time I picked this up in 2015. I hadn't engineered anything (laughs) since graduating from college, to be honest with you. And so by submersing myself around data scientists and principal engineers and experts in project management and helping all that design thinking for, you know, solving for business challenges, it really allowed me to upskill my leadership and think more like an owner than a doer. And I think those are going to be the skills. If you focus in on those two things, making sure that your ecosystem has partners that are ethical and cyber secure, and that you are focusing in on growing your skill sets to figure out where you can play a role in that team. It doesn't have to be the most technical person in the room. You can start to absorb and learn. Full disclosure, I literally thought For the first two years of sitting around with these data scientists, they were speaking another language. It was so confusing to me, and I tend to pick things up pretty quickly, but it's kind of like entrepreneurship was for me. It takes you a while to map some of the terms to what you already know, but Mm -hmm. eventually you realize, oh, we're all kind of saying the same thing with different words. Mm -hmm. And it really is about, you know, going back to, you know, root causing a problem and being able to do some hypothesis testing and start to move the needle. And I think AI is a really exciting tool to do that. It makes it a lot easier to ingest and find the wisdom in oceans of data. I think it's wonderful advice as well. And I'm sure that many individuals listening to this conversation are going to be able to profit from the advice that you've given there. I'd also like to thank you for the educational journey that you've taken me on today. 
I've certainly discovered a lot and had plenty food for thought that I'll take away from this conversation. Um, hey, Lauren, I would love to hear back from you because I, I'm getting in the habit of asking this so I can be more specific in my future conversations. What's your big takeaway from today that you learned? Because, you know, I spent a lot of years being an operator and now I'm trying to be more of a visible role model to inspire the next generation of operators in this space. What did you take away? Sure. I think it's a really excellent question. I And I'm also being <laughs> enjoying being on the other side of, of the conversation. What I did take away is an ignitement on my side to follow a similar passion that I've identified in yourself. And I think that that is something that is aspirational and inspirational. There's not a lot, and I can say this from being inundated with requests that we get for people to come on the show that there's still very little representation in the tech field alone of females that have the courage, the know-how, the charisma and the passion to want to integrate themselves so extensively in something that's obviously contributing to such good cause. So I would say that that's what I've taken from the conversation and it certainly sparked my enthusiasm far more. Thank you so much, Lauren. So that really touches my heart and makes it all worthwhile because sometimes I feel like maybe there's just not a pull for voices like me out there in the market. So for people that want to role model something different for tech ethics and responsibility, please consider checking out my book, Go Reboot Your Career in 90 Days, because I literally took every single thing I've learned from this journey on how to go from being successful from the I, from the vision of your parents and maybe what you were trained success is to being significant in your mission of using your skills to something that matters to you that leaves a legacy. Are you satisfied in, in your, to where you've come in your own journey? Like, do you do it from, I mean, I sense the passion in your voice, the way that you speak, the way that you express yourself. Also, you can see in the dedication of your efforts toward other individuals that maybe can't represent themselves. That's, as I've mentioned many times, admirable in itself. But do you feel fulfilled in your own journey as to where you've come? Yeah, I can say that I alluded to this earlier in the podcast. I was diagnosed with a very scary vascular autoimmune disease in 2021 after I got COVID and got really sick and just didn't get well after that. So I spent the last few years working like I may have five left to do what I think is important in the world. Sorry to hear that. that you're oh, good. thank you. It's been a couple years of experimentation and I fortunately have been able to find the right medical treatment and the right team. And I now have 50 years to plan. But I wrote my book and I did the TED Talk and I got the Executive of the Year Award all after becoming disabled and not being able to work more than 20 hours a week for the last few years. So I've really focused in on how can we do the, how can we work smarter and do this better so that all the brilliant minds can be activated to do something in this transition than making it personal about me. I had the luxury of a couple head starts in entrepreneurship with, you know, an executive from Apple that got wind of my vision and invested his time and his talent in it. Unfortunately, fortunately, he was there with me to run Minor Guard and film my TED Talk, but he passed away in 2022 from a COVID-induced heart attack. Thank and you. I just want people to know the power of male allies and women's journeys in in the tech field. He saw a vision and something in me I never saw. And I hope this book sparks you to maybe see something in yourself or someone around you that maybe is a blind spot to you where you can step into leading. No, definitely. That's certainly very encouraging. And I'm sure that people will find comfort in your in your own story as well. We all have a unique thing to bring to this world. And it's not working 12 hours a day for somebody else's company on something you don't care about. It's an opportunity now to step out and lead inside or outside your company. Definitely. Thank you so much for sharing this with us today and everything else that you've shared on Be Define and AI. Thank you. Lauren, thank you for having me. I found this to be such a motivating conversation and I will take that positive momentum forward. So thank you. That's wonderful to hear. And I'd like to thank everyone else who's contributed to the conversation, come on this journey with us. And if you like the episode, then share it. Share it with your friend, share it with your mom, share it with your dad. 